On the recording program, I'm first. <coughs> We're going to talk about the history of planning in Florida, and that is not an oxymoron. <laughs> now, if we can figure all this out, we'll go. There we go. We've got to push the thing. Let's oh. push that, right? Ah, there we are. Okay. That's a, that's a map of, 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 of Florida, showing all the 67 counties. And, uh,
Yeah. We've got to have some themes. What it is, what is it we want to carry through uh, you know, in writing this book? And one of those themes that we thought, well, you know, Florida has been sort of in land speculation for one heck of a long while. You know, back to the Spaniards and particularly the English and so forth. Uh, nothing wrong with land speculation. It's just uh, uh, when it begins to run rampant, and that can be a problem. So we want to look at land speculation. We want to look at localism. And what we're talking about here, where our interest was, is, is in excessive localism. Uh, and we, you know, we looked internally you know, uh, at all of that. And also we thought another important aspect in terms of planning and growth management is that of citizen participation. Well, as we went through, we certainly did cover that, but we did not cover that as to the extent, extent that we had hoped to. And that's another time, another visit, or we will get the urge again. We've got to get a paragraph on that. We have to get that lunch very key, by the way. Uh, as we worked through the book, a few other things began to pop up. Started to Harry Malachi's growth machines and growth coalitions, and showing you the power they have in influencing land decisions and influencing and turning things their particular way, and a whole variety of things of that nature. Some will get toward the end. Uh, but through this whole period, we, we find that planning emerged and then planning would wane. It would emerge, emerge, and then it would wane for a variety of reasons. We started looking at the planned cities back in the, well, it says 18th century up there, but I think we're talking mostly about the 19th century, uh, which a number of them you know, coming up, Florida's railroad towns, whether we're talking about the extension down the east coast or across the panhandle to east-west or across the midsection of the state east-west. A lot of new towns being popped up at that point in time. Uh, Florida's planned towns, and we'll come back to that. Uh, all that extension and growth, and also particularly in Florida's boom and bust period of the 1920s. The early 1920s were periods of boom, as, as all of you are aware of, certain. And then later on, starting in 1926, came the bust, and this preceded the National Recession, the Great Depression. Uh, but back to uh, town planning and the exciting period of the early 1900s. The first plan that we've come across, and some of you, you know, uh, sitting out there may be able to correct us on this, but the first plan we came across was that of St. Petersburg in 1908. <coughs> 1908. And that was basically because W.L. Straub, who was the publisher editor of the St. Pete Weekly at that point in time, uh, he was interested, he was sort of uh, enamored with the City Beautiful moment that had come out of Chicago <coughs> World's Fair in the late uh, 1800s. And he was also concerned with finding public lands. And of course, you look at the pier that's in St. Petersburg today, and that's a result of, of, his, of his effort. The map behind here is not from that 1908 plan, but I think it's from about 1926, actually. Uh, we can look at, and people talk about, well, Coral Gables. Here we have George Merrick, of course, uh, who wanted to do a Spanish tile suburb, which certainly had lasting effect. Uh, where? Well, on his father's former orange grove, uh, which we've seen happen a lot. Uh, we've had Kelsey City, is one that's often referred to. And this was Kelsey. Kelsey was the founder or owner or whatever you call the CEO today of the Waldorf Cafeteria. Uh, some of you in gray here who live in urban areas may remember the Waldorf Cafeteria. I've eaten there. I wouldn't recommend it to many people, however. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. I don't think they exist. No. This was uh, Florida's first model city, that was this uh, Kelsey City. And this really today has been renamed as Lake Park. And that's just south of North Palm Beach. Uh, we had Boca Raton in 1925, all this period of a lot of private development. Uh, Boca Raton, that was Addison Meisner, an architect. <coughs> he was, you know, in, in his mind, he was thinking about the Venice of Florida, bringing some of the Mediterranean aspects here in Florida. Uh, he had envisioned and hoped to have built a, a boulevard or of 20 lanes divided. 20 lanes, we're talking about the 1920s. And in the middle 
would be a Grand Canal. So, lots of vision here on thought of that man. Well, you know, the boss took care of that man. We had J.C. Penny in terms of Penny Farms. And this is located west of St. Augustine. We had Palm Beach in 1929. Uh, Addison Meisner again. We had uh, Sarasota brought John Rowland back in, and John Rowland had done work back in 1908 with St. Pete. He came back in a number of, uh, and helped out a number of Florida communities, a, a nationally known you know, planner architect. Uh, but anyway, he helps out the national planning organizations and all as well. Uh, and then if we would jump on ahead and uh, pay due respect to you know, some later developments of uh, the late 1950s and 1960s, uh, Miami Lakes is one that we point to. And the gentleman coming up on stage a little later who played a very major role in that. One correction. Correction. Palm Beach was, uh, it was a Palm Beach Garden Club. Hired an architectural firm from, from uh, Chicago to design their plan. And I have a copy of their plan at home. It probably ought to be in somebody's archive. I guess I should have said that Meisner lived in Palm Beach. Well, I'm not sure he ended up somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. <laughs> we did that all through the writing. Huh? We do have the same. <laughs> We're still rewriting. We do have to make some reference back to the uh, 1930s because, you know, uh, as many of us now have been thinking back on because that was the time of the Great Depression and that was the time the 1930s brought the federal government uh, response to the Great Depression, particularly uh, in terms of the National Public Works Program. Uh, and we not only had national planning going on in the President's office at that point in time, but they set up state planning and we had a Florida State Planning Board. Uh, also we had county planning because the idea was look at public works to identify what the needs were in each county, send that up to the state plan, the states would then send it to the national plan. Well, they didn't get all that far, uh, but that was the basic idea of all of that. And I'd like to, look, like to look back on that, because, particularly because of the state-county relations as Florida's first <coughs> environmental planning law, because there was that connection there. Uh, World War II is up there. World War II is up there. Okay, thank you, Carol. But then we had, what happened in World War II? Well, the attention's focused away from the need for planning. And about 1940, we did away with the Florida State Planning Board. <coughs> we began to look at, uh, you know, bringing troops and, you know, not only troops, but uh, all sorts of military industries, etc., shipyards, uh, airfields, into the state of Florida. Prisoner of war. Well, Florida became, yes, the location of many new military bases, and as Earl just said, we had a number of you know, war camps, of prisoner of war camps throughout the, uh, throughout the country, excuse me, throughout the state of Florida. And in fact, this guy was raised across the street from one of those. You pick up the well, I don't want to tell that story. This yeah, guy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was raised in Winter Haven across the street, across the railroad from the uh, prisoner of war camp. And I was in high school and watching I guess I was a junior or something. I was watching these guys over there pole vaulting on the inside of the camp. And I thought this was pretty interesting because the fence is only about 10 feet. <laughs> they, were, they were clearing the fence, you know, inside the camp. They were trying to... But one night, one of those guys went over the fence and that ran through our yard, and all of a sudden there was an array of bullets and stuff. And I thought, I thought my mother and I were in the war. <laughs> I guess we were. Well, that was a period, and for good reason, that there was a waning of interest in planning. But after the war, that was not picked up. That interest wasn't there. State governments weren't really all that interested in the 1930s, except they had to do it. They weren't that interested immediately after World War II. They didn't have to do it. They didn't have to do it until the federal government came back in with the 701 planning, you know, assistance program, that 701 grant program in, in the 1950s. We're hopping over a lot of things here, I know, but we've got a lot of things to cover this evening. Uh, and this brought planning back in. Again, it brought it back into